Hey everybody, welcome to Geek Impulse. I am here with Victor Rivers, um, best known for many different things. One of my favorite things is uh, the Mask of Zorro. Uh, I love your performance in that. I just I have to say it's one of my one of my favorites. And then I think the one that you're probably known for the most is Blood In Blood Out, uh, which is also an awesome performance by you. I must say, and, and a lot of people feel the same way. Uh, but we're here today to talk to Victor about Alamo HeroCon in San Antonio. So what are your thoughts on the city of San Antonio? Have you been there before? I know you're saying you live in uh, LA. You know, what is it that you that you like about the city if you've been there before? And then how do you feel about being able to actually deeply connect with your fans during this con? given the situation uh, that we're currently in? Well, interestingly enough, um, <clears throat> um, because my business, you know, the acting world was shut down like everybody else's for uh, the last year. So I had to figure out, you know, um, a, a way to, you know, <laughs> to basically support myself because without going into my retirement, you Got know, it. Yeah. And, and so I didn't want to touch that. And, uh, and I knew that there was a big fan base for blood and blood out and some other films, but especially blood and blood out. So, um, I actually, um, I got together with my, uh, my partner and we created a meet and greet business in the middle of the pandemic. And, uh, so one of the first cities that, uh, that I went to was San Antonio. And, uh, interestingly enough, when I was in San Antonio, I met someone very special and who we've been seeing each other uh, you know for the last uh, year and so i'm in san antonio a lot so i love the city um i love the fact that that uh it was quite surprising because you know austin used to be the city in texas that was considered kind of the cool hip you know place i'd done a film there we won the uh, the, the the old austin film festival which is now the south by southwest uh, in a film that i did years ago um, so, but, uh, San Antonio is charming. It's very Latino, which of course, you know, my, uh, I was born in Cuba. So my first language is Spanish. Yes. So, um, and, uh, it's just has so many things to do. It's got great cuisine and, uh, that, you know, we were even able to go out, you know, during the pandemic because, uh, the, for those of us that live in California, we were much more shut down than Texas is. Yes. And, uh, so, um, you know, I really feel like what the what this this last year has been for all of us is was a great equalizer you know unless we were unless you're an uber rich person it pretty yeah. much muddled everybody and so i think that we all kind of needed a distraction during this time and so i had never been out to meet the fans i've never done a comic-con this will be my first one. Oh wow okay that's that's pretty awesome yeah so um and uh but what i've discovered is is that there's <clears throat> You know, these, you know, like I really, really enjoy meeting all the people. There's a real respect and, and a real loyalty, especially to Blood and Blood Out uh, for that particular film. It's 28 years old. It's got three generations of fans now. Yeah. And, uh, you know, people tattoo my image on their body, which is like. That's, <laughs> that's pretty intense. As, as, <laughs> as, 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 and my character's name is Magic Mike. So I, I tell everybody I'm the original Magic Mike. And, <laughs> and my, my guy doesn't dance. So well, uh, there is a shower scene there. I don't remember if you yeah, actually, you know, <laughs> that's me. That's my no double for that one. But uh, uh, but uh, uh, but what I have discovered is that is that, um, you know, all of us um, have been through um, and we're still coming out of it um, yeah. through quite a, a, a historic time that's been very, very uh, um, kind of humbling, I think, for a lot of us. And uh, so um, it's been really great to connect. And again, I love San Antonio. I'm really looking forward to this weekend. I hope everyone will come out. And we got a lot, you know, a pretty big lineup now that I'm, I'm excited about. And um, <clears throat> so, um, so yeah, that's like I say, I love San Antonio, and I, you know, and there's someone there I love. So it it works out really nicely. That's awesome. And I did see um, if you want to briefly talk about it, I, I saw you you kind of do like meet and greets at some what seems to be low rider car shows, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I saw that on your Instagram, you know, I was creeping you out just a little bit yeah. you know, doing, my, <laughs> doing my research. Um, but I thought that was really cool. I've been to low rider car shows myself. I have a friend who builds low riders. Mm -hmm. uh, he's an awesome guy. And it's a culture that mm -hmm. and it's it's a culture of itself, but they're very loyal and fun people to be around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we've done, uh, uh, we did a couple of car shows in the last uh, couple of weekends. 
Um, so yeah, and it's it's amazing because there is there is you know there is such a camaraderie. There's such an investment in in the vehicles themselves, and um, and uh, and again, it's it's a culture that uh, that feeds in really well with blood and blood out also. Uh, and 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 again, I want to just. Um, uh, it's not just a Latino culture that loves this film because it, this film has a worldwide following because I will have people from from Turkey, from Germany, from South Africa that will, you know, basically recreate scenes from the movie and you'll see them on Instagram and stuff. So there's fans <laughs> around the world. But um, but I think because of the truth of the movie, yeah. uh, you know, and especially because, you know, there's, you know, La Raza, you know, the the the, you know, the Chicano culture is, mm -hmm. is represented so strongly in, in that film of many of the films that I've done, but this one is is especially um, um, poignant because I think the, a lot of people don't know is the writer of the film is in the film, but he is an award-winning Chicano poet named Jimmy Santiago Baca who taught himself to read and write in prison. Mm -hmm. So they say San Quentin in the movie, we're in San Quentin. The oh, you're actually filming in Yeah, the warden, the, the, the warden in the movie is the warden. So oh, we, wow. we are okay. filming. We are filming among fifty five hundred inmates. Wow! And and we had to sign no hostage policy. So basically, you know, if they took the, the warden hostage, they, they weren't going to give one of us up, or or they took one of us up, we weren't going to. You know, basically, we we had to sign basically sign away uh, um, um, and know that we were living under their rules. And and when I say their rules, I'm talking about the, the inmates' rules. And wow. so I stayed in character all day. I was magic 12 to 16 hours a day, every day for five weeks. That's intense. And yeah. yeah so I, I didn't so, know that, you know, yeah. like, so let me ask you this then for blood in blood out. Like, how did you actually prepare for such an iconic role like magic Mike? You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. and obviously you touched on how it's still relevant worldwide, mm -hmm. but do you think that it's still relevant as far as, these things are still going on in places like Los Angeles and other mm -hmm. parts of California and the world. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how'd you prepare for that and how relevant do you think it still is? I think it's, well, it's absolutely, uh, you know, there it's really interesting because I have, you know, and we'll probably talk a little bit about my, my advocacy, but be, you know, the fact that I've actually uh, spoken to incarcerated youth and, and so they will actually see the film before I come, you know, they'll show them the film, they've already seen it, but they'll like, you know, refresh their memory and they're real excited because magic's gonna come talk to them. And then I walk in the room and they go, dude, you're so old. And, <laughs> you know, and because that's how relevant it is because to them it's still, even though it, you know, the film starts and takes place in the seventies and moves into a little bit of the eighties um, and what was going on in the prison system in the Southwest, but especially in, in California, um, there's a real relevancy to it. And I can tell you that um, as I walked around that prison yard, um, uh, it, that could have been me wow. because that's the direction I was heading as a young man. When we can talk a little bit about that when um, if we come to that. But but that's so I think that that's the power of the film. There's a real truth in it. And and uh, and and it is it's about family. It's 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 about uh, choices in life. You know the three main characters each make a different choice and one makes the wrong choice and ends up in you know in the prison system and uh so um and what's interesting is that uh, that the studio that actually you know that did the film you know it says hollywood pictures which is a was it, hollywood pictures is, is an arm of disney oh wow so, okay so when we turned it in they kind of flipped out <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so this film didn't get you know it got about seven days in the movie theaters and they they pulled it out of the movie theaters mm. and uh and so this life this movie is is really the fan base it's yeah. it's those that connected to it um uh, again uh, you know certainly the latino culture and the chicano culture but but other people from around the world connected to the truth of of what happens um uh, in certain environments and, and that where people don't have maybe as many opportunities and yeah. so choices. No, I agree with you. Um, you know, me, myself, I grew up in Southern California uh, mm -hmm. around a lot of Hispanics, um, you know, and so I learned some Spanish along the way because I needed to. Mm -hmm. I also learned watching vi uh, movies like yours, uh, mm -hmm. Blood In, Blood Out, things like that. Like how, how to be, how do I say this? You know, how to be more, you know, macho, right mm -hmm. um walk around with more confidence and being able to interact with uh the people in my community 
um, because, you know, I was I would get bullied and things like that. Mm-hmm. And then I, I kind of hardened up a little bit. It's movies like yours that kind of showed me that, you know, people are just being themselves, you mm-hmm. know, and this they you don't know where they come from, how their lives are. And but you you're able to connect with them because you're from the same community, you know, and I got a lot of respect from learning Spanish and these types of things. And so your movie changed my life for the better in my youth, mm-hmm. you know, growing up, like I said, in L.A. and things like that, um, because I stood out like a sore thumb. I mean, I've got <laughs> right, yeah. uh, Penny Rojo right here. Right. right I, yeah. got, I got the orange hair. You know, I'm walking down the street. You know, they're like, go get go get them, you know, and I it was it was challenging for me. But, mm-hmm. you know, it helped me grow as a person. So I definitely see that. And, and that's uh, another reason why I was excited to talk about you for that. But then also to talk about you because your father, right? Yeah. You're, you're an advocate and an author. Like, how does, how do you do it all? I mean, this, this mm-hmm. is a, an incredible life that you've lived where you've managed to do all these different things, you know, and how'd you do that? How'd you do that? How'd you go about choosing these different paths? I know you've talked about it before in past interviews, I'm sure, mm-hmm. but like which one, if any sticks out the most as having the most impact on your life? Well, I would say that that uh, well, I will start by saying that I'm really proud of my film work. And as they say, you know, film celluloid will live on forever. So that's that's a beautiful thing. And Blood and Blood Out has actually been nominated for the uh, the, the National Film Registry. So, you know, we'll see what happens with that. So I'm very proud that that will live on. But my my feeling is, is that if I can leave a social footprint behind, that I help to create a more humane and peaceful world, then I feel like that my time and my story um, was relevant and that I paid it forward. And when I say I paid it forward, when there's the African saying that we all heard that it takes a village to raise a child, mm. well, I'm that child. I was taken in by my high school in Miami. At 15 years old, I was a gang member. I had just, you know, run away from home. I had fought my father and, and won. I grew up in an, an incredible, uh, horrible uh, domestic and child abuse and uh, domestic violence and child abuse in my home uh, at a time when the police weren't going to do anything. So the title of my book is called The Private Family Matter. Yeah. That's what the police told me at 12 years old when I took my clothes off so they could see my body. And it was covered in bruises, welts, and burns. And they said, we're horrified at what we're seeing, but there's nothing more we can do. It's a private family matter. So, so, you know, my community took me in after I ran away from home in Miami in high school. And, uh, uh, you know, I went from being this homicidal, suicidal gang member, six foot two, over 200 pounds, angry with a, with a man's body. Scary dude. (laughs) I was was magic. I was that, I was, I was little, little magic, you know, already at that point. And they were able to, to help sort of transform me. They gave me seven homes to live in. I wasn't a foster child with paperwork. It was just like, you come stay with us. You come stay with this family. And interestingly enough, the last family that took me in was another Cuban family and their son became an actor and, and he changed his last name because nobody could say it in Hollywood, but he's Stephen Bauer. Stephen Bauer is from his Manny and Scarface and, and we got then. And so I grew up in, so I'm like his brother. We grew up in, in, in that. But um, so I was able to transform in, in two and a half years from gang member, president of my school. And because I was a good athlete, I was able to um, uh, earn a full uh, football scholarship to Florida State University, where I played for the Seminoles. And then uh, I graduated with a degree in criminology, which God knows why I'm an actor. <laughs> I was going into law enforcement. And, uh, and, but I was the first Cuban American. Uh, I was a free agent draft pick, but the first Cuban American to be given a try with the Miami Dolphins. So I was out with the Miami Dolphins for two, two uh, uh, preseasons. Nice. And, uh, which was a you know a big deal but you know my story is the story of that you can break that cycle of violence and that you can unlearn the behavior and so part of my the reason that i wrote a book that i you know that that i give back in those ways is to to basically pay it forward to those who invested in me and to let people know that that you know again the journey of ma- you know magic could have been mine had I didn't, you know, had I not had the the intervention of of these loving and caring people that saw a potential in me that I didn't see in myself, and so and because of my education, I was able to articulate my pain through my words and not with my fists anymore. Yeah. So 
So that's, you know, that's part of it. And so, yeah, and I, and, you know, I'm proud my son is now 26. He graduated from Harvard and. Oh, uh, wow. That, that's yeah. awesome. So, yeah. So that's part of my journey is like a lot of people will say, wow, your son went to Harvard. I go, you know, given my background and where I grew up and, and I say, yeah, you know, and so that's, uh, you know, I'm proud of the young man that he's become. And he started uh, joining me at the podium, speaking out against uh, family violence and just violence in general, um, since he was uh, five and a half years old. Oh, wow. so, so that's part of my journey. And, and those characters actually show up in my, in, in my, I mean, the, you know, my life shows up in my characters a lot because I'll have people that are interviewing me and they'll say, wow, where did you find that guy? And I'll say, I live with him. You know, it was my father, you know, I mean, it was, he was a really scary guy who was this quiet while he was being the most deviant and the most violent. Um, yeah. Usually it's the, the, the ones that are quiet because they're, yeah. they're sitting there, they're reserved. They're, they're very confident. They know what they're capable of and they ain't worried about anything. Right, you know. So that's 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 that part of my story. And again, uh, we will probably <clears throat> at the Comic Con we'll definitely have uh, copies of my book there called "The Private Family Matter." And uh, you know, and uh, so um, again, it's it's uh, uh, I'm proud of that journey. Again, I love my you know I love being part of the film industry and having films that not only Blood and Blood Out like you were saying, Oscar Zorro. I've I've been in the Hulk. I've been in you know lots of different films yes. that that are relevant to the Comic Cons. Uh, and Star Trek, and I actually, my Star Trek character has a, like a card that people send me from around the world really? that, you know, for me to sign. It's, it's a, this character called Altavar, who is mm. like, you, know, you would not recognize me because I'm completely in, 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 in a prosthetics. And I mean, uh, and, and then I've got ruby red eyes and, and uh, but, uh, but yeah, so that's, that's part of my, sort of my life story is that of, of um, being able to overcome uh, with the help of my community. And I think that's the most important thing. So you you may reach out to somebody and not know that you're really changing a person's life. So my educators were, you know, a big part of my, even though a couple of them that were tough love people that I didn't like. And then I found out later in life that they were the first ones to defend me. Yeah. What others weren't so sure about me. So. Yeah. It's, it's interesting how that works. You know, you, you maybe don't trust some individuals to really go to bat for you. Uh, because they're really hard on you, but that's because they see the potential and believe in what you can become. And then they they surprise you by being an advocate for you when you need them the most. And those types of things are beautiful because it does help to shape and change the trajectory of a person's life. And I've always been a, um, a believer in that. And I always hope that that happens more because I, I in no way have ever been in your shoes, but I didn't grow up well either myself. And I had teachers, mentors that kind of guided me to change my life. So mm -hmm. that's why I really connected with you when you were talking about, you know, how your story is in your life and how, what you went through um, and in no way comparable to mine for sure. Um, but I think it's beautiful that you were able to make this amazing career that you've made for yourself that has spanned decades. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and again, we, and, and by the way, we all have stories to tell. And that's the beauty of, of you know, we have to, whether we do it orally, whether we put it on paper, and, and even if, if, you know, the fans that are, might be watching this, you know, you probably, they, they, they'll have their stories. Even if you, you put it down on paper, it's just for you. It's not that you're gonna publish it or whatever, but just, you know, write it down because there, there is a real catharsis that happens when, you know, when I wrote the book, it was like crazy because, because, you know, it was like, I was going, wow, it was, you know, my memory and the things were real, real clear, but it was also, there was a real cleansing that happened while I wrote. It. So it was very therapeutic for you to actually, absolutely. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's beautiful. I really like that. I, I, hopefully I'll be able to, uh, get a signed copy from you. I, I will be there at, uh, Alamo HeroCon myself. Great, great, great. So if I can, uh, definitely going to do that. And like I, I want to sort of transition just a bit sure. now to another role you played, and we kind of touched on on a little bit, and that is the Mask of Zero, because that is one of my my favorite ones because mm -hmm. there's a lot of comedy to it. I, I feel like a lot of people don't realize it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, spoiler alert: Yeah, your your character, you know, dies, what have you, but the interaction you have with Antonio Banderas and, and everybody else in certain scenes, like it's, mm -hmm. 
it's amazing that how versatile you are right if somebody if somebody were to look at you know blood and blood out and then go watch the massive zorro and see you they'd be like wow this guy has range and is incredibly talented so i guess you know how was it like working on the set do you keep in contact with antonio banderas like how was that all there and that experience was for you well, here's a really, really funny story about about that is Stephen Bauer, who I, I spoke about, uh, was married to Melanie Griffith okay. and, and they have a child together. And mm. so so then suddenly I'm now going to be playing playing her new husband's brother in this movie. <laughs> and Melanie was there with us in Mexico, too. So it was just the funniest. So it was, uh. it was kind of situation but but uh um but the beauty of of uh, one i love working with antonio because there was something i requested of him because we were, we were playing brothers in the film and and i said to him uh because i i watched him in mambo kings and mambo kings is about cubans and and antonio told me he said he didn't he basically learned how to speak english phonetically for the role he couldn't speak english for oh, mambo. Wow. and so he was doing his accent sound, sounded very castilian very spanish and and Armando Sante was doing like Ricky Ricardo meets Tony Montana <laughs> accent and, and they didn't mix. And so I was going, you know, for this film, I want to make sure that we're symbiotic, that we have this relationship. So I asked uh, through the producers, I said, can you, you know, you know, because Antonio started before me and I, you know, so I said, can you have him send me a little tape of him just talking in his character so I can hear it? And what he did was he took one step further. He wrote me a beautiful letter. Mm that he read to me on tape so I could hear his voice saying, oh. you know, dear Joaquin, you know, blah, blah, blah. But here's what a lot of people don't know is, and and you, you know, you may not know this, but it's, uh, my character is based on a real, on a, on a real person whose name is Joaquin Murieta, just like in the film, I'm Joaquin Murieta. And he was this famous outlaw. He's basically the guy, this, the, the guy that wrote Zorro, the, the novel. Yes. Yeah. You know, his, his sort of, image for Zorro was Joaquin Murieta because what happened was back in the gold rush days, the Mexicans were actually finding a lot of the gold. And then the Anglos were coming in and stealing it from the Mexicans. And and then they basically, when, when, in, you know, in, in an incident, they, they came through Joaquin Murieta's farm and they killed part of his family. They raped, wow. raped and murdered his wife. And basically he, he put together a, a posse and to go seek vengeance and so he was stealing the gold back from from the uh from the the, the anglos and giving it back to the to the, you know to the mexicans so he was like the mexican robin robin hood, hood. Uh, okay and and but when they they would go out and do this at night when when you know the the others were sleeping and so they would go to the coal i mean to the to the fire for you know the their, their campfires and get the ashes and put it on their eyes to create uh. and there's the mask and so that's so so and then in order to prove that they had killed Joaquin Murieta, they cut his head off and stuffed it in a jar and they then took it around all these county fairs. So you can see posters. It'll say, come see the head of Joaquin Murieta, because, as you know, that's what happens to me in the film. I lose my head and it ends up in a jar. Yeah. So so it's based on that reality. And so, you know, it really was, uh, you know, I was surprised when they cast me to play Antonio's brother because there was a size differential. And yet, you know, they worked out perfectly. They put me in flats. They put him in, in you know, period boots that, that had some, some height to them. And they put brown contacts in my eyes. And suddenly, you know, we looked like brothers on screen. And, and it worked. So, you know, it was a real fun film. And, and, you know, it was a real coup that they got Anthony Hopkins to play the, the old Zorro. <laughs> because he brought this other element to it. And yet it was still campy and fun. And, and the, you know, because I grew up with Zorro on TV as a kid, you know, the, you know, the, the, the TV version of Zorro. So um, it was really, an, and the, the entire film was filmed in Mexico. And that's why it looks so beautiful too. It's, you know, we're, we're actually in these, you know, we filmed in the Sonora desert and I'll get, it's just a really funny, you know, set story because I'm sure some of the fans would like to hear this. So when Antonio and I arrived on the set, we're in the middle of the desert and uh and we see there's like 15 day laborers with machetes in their hands like this they're, they're standing around wow. and antonio and i antonio and i are like going you know we we speak spanish so we walk right up to him we go hey you know what what's going on why you know and he goes and one of the guys says we killed 15 already today and we go 15 what snakes and uh. it, turns out, it turns out the sonora desert has the biggest concentration of venomous snakes in the entire world 
Oh, wow. That's so, and we were going to be rolling on this. You saw for the movie, we're on the ground. <laughs> so exactly. And, and they had five ambulances lined up just in case, because there was no like helicopter to take us out. They were going to just throw you in a, in a, in a, you know, in an ambulance and take you out of there if you got bit by a snake. So that was kind of the, you know, the, the reality of where we were shooting. And, uh, but we had a great time. And, and, uh, and again, uh, um, I've seen Antonio, couple times over the years just because my connection with Melanie but uh, I haven't seen him recently but but again I just found him to be a charming guy he's a real um, he has a great facility to to um, to take on whatever he's doing and become almost an expert in it like his sword fighting is incredible in the film he's doing the sword fighting oh okay yeah. that's good to know like you know so many people have doubles in a lot of different yeah. things yeah. So. I mean for some of the maybe the crazy horse stunts yeah but but any of the and by the way all the sword fighting on the ground anthony hopkins did too he oh did wow okay his own, his own sword fighting so we they put us all through sword fighting classes even though i was ever gonna fight but i was sword fighting uh you know my the person next to me sword fighting was Catherine zeta jones so i was like you know when just before it kind of launched her career so it, was, <laughs> you know, it was fun but yeah anyway. it, would, it would have been great to be on that set for sure so many yeah. uh big names and incredible talent uh, yeah. to include yourself so I mean that's that's pretty awesome and those stories are are things that I think make the fans fall in love even more so I definitely appreciate you sharing all that mm -hmm. um, because I think the fans will get a kick out of that I mean mm -hmm. yeah snakes are snakes are scary that's all I gotta say I'm not a big I'm not a big fan of them you know and so anytime I go to the desert I'm, I'm definitely on mm -hmm. on edge you know it's right. just ugh. Yeah, <laughs> give me the creeps here. Um, not you, the uh, the snakes. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, again, we're, we're going to the comic con, right? So, what I guess I would say, you know, maybe fans would like to know what comics, if any, are your favorite. You know, or, or what's your favorite character? You know, what are things that maybe stick out to you in that industry uh, mm -hmm. that you are a, a fan of yourself? Well, I mean, I grew up more more with the DC than than Marvel. Or at least that's that's what I gravitated to. So, you know, I grew up with Superman. I grew up with Batman. And uh, as a matter of fact, I've done um, I've done um, uh, I was you know uh, for the WB. I've done lots of voices uh, for uh, Batman Beyond and uh and actually uh and also the justice league yes um, i did a three episode arc of, of you know the basically hawk guy who comes down yeah. you know, to you know to rotalic to... I, th I think i pronounced uh, that correctly yeah uh, rotalic yeah who uh is basically engaged to hawk girl mm. and uh, here's a funny tidbit for for the fans out there too so because the 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 actress and i can't remember her name right now but the actress who's who's the voice of uh hawk girl she's cuban Ooh. So when they cast all of all of us coming down from the planet, you know, from our planet, they hired all of us are Latinos. Oh wow! <laughs> they want us to use accents, but basically, there's a you know, Latinos have a certain rhythm in their in their conversation. Yes, that's so, true. So there was you know there was her Hector Alizondo was my lieutenant. You know, that was one of the voices. Elizabeth Pena was another another you know Cuban actress. So we we all had this like just similar patter, and uh, so it was just hilarious because when we did you know we laid down the the, the voices, we, there was like six of us in the room. We were all you know, happened to be Latino. So there's there's a little inside story for uh, for that. But but I you know I would say uh, back to the, your question. You know Batman, Superman. Uh, you know those are the characters that that I sort of related to. And then from Marvel, I would say, because um, I know that was that was a uh, uh, you know if there was like a character that I could see myself uh, as interest because he doesn't really talk talk would be the Hulk, and that's mm -hmm. and that's because when I was younger I was so angry um, that when I played college football at Florida State, um, my teammates nicknamed me the Mad Cuban. Oh, okay. because they, they said when I put a helmet on, I would change personalities and, and you needed to get out of my way. And, uh, and it was because they didn't know my story. They didn't know that I had all this rage inside mm -hmm. from, from, you know, being being mistreated as a child and you know, all the abuse and everything else. So I understood that, you know, how I could change. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and so the Hulk was somebody that, you know, you could get me really angry and I could become the mad Cuban. So in essence, I could become the, the, the Hulk. And, uh, and so, um, you know, 
but I just think that the whole, you know, that this this whole and you know uh, Marvel and and it just uh, you know the explosion of of these you know these characters, these movies, and um, it is really amazing and fantastic. And and you know some of the ones that that always surprise me are you know are films like you know Guardians of the Galaxy or you know they, so you you can tweak you know you can tweak you know different. Uh, uh, different storylines and um, but uh, there's just you know they have a bastion of, of great characters and of course you know how many people have played Batman and uh, and it's always funny because even the television Batman I don't know why but they all they all have to have that voice you know that yeah that's that's uh, that's quite interesting one, you know, going, I, I, but, but why you know was it Adam West who started that then I mean who yeah, Adam. Well, Adam was with the, you know, the, that was. You know, I'm old enough to remember the TV version. It was one of my favorite, and, and the original Joker was as, as, as Cesar Romero, who was this great, you know, like Latino. Yes. Actor. And uh, but uh, yeah, but it started. But then you know, and then Michael Keaton was the first, you know, the first, you know, big, you know, Batman that exploded. And so I actually did a film with him right after he had done Batman. He was a huge. I did a film with him called One Good Cop, which was the same studio. That, that that is blood and blood out. I did Distinguished Gentleman with Eddie Murphy, which is also Hollywood Pictures, which is a great good film as well. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, but I, you know, I got to work with Michael Keaton, and he was just, you know, delightful. And and uh, um, uh, but you know, he was Batman. You know, <laughs> it's like it's, yeah, something about that voice. Everybody always has to have that voice when you know they once they have the, you know, the mask on, they they definitely the get in that to that yeah. persona. So that's I, I think that's. Yeah, I don't know why they do that, but hey, you know, um, Christian Bell even had it. Yeah, you know, yeah, so yeah. it's it's interesting, but yeah, that's part of who it is now, right? So right. if anybody's going to play it, I guess the fans do uh, anticipate and expect that. Well, I guess so, if you had a high voice, it may not be the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think I could do it myself. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we'll see. Yeah. So you know, maybe maybe we'll uh, get the fans that are watching this to try to uh, get you trending on Twitter for something in the uh, DCEU or MCU films. That'd be awesome. I mean, I would love to see you in something like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, I'm, I'm, you know, it's interesting because it just now, uh, our industry just now started to uh, pick back up. So um, I think we're at about 40%, mm -hmm. but, but our world has changed completely too because um, this is how I audition now. Oh, wow. I don't, walk into, I don't walk into a room. And so at home, I mean, you know, it's like I've got I've got the lights, I've got, you know, I've got to wear all the hats, I've got, a, you know, the wireless microphone, I've got all the little things that I have to do. And and I'm just now feeling really comfortable, you know, being able to like set everything up and then and then do the work. Because, you know, when I'm when you're, you know, when you're in charge of everything, sometimes you've got too many things going on. And it's like you, you know, you lose that 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 connection to you know the role you're going in for which which is you know i've always enjoyed walking into a room with directors and producers and and going here i am and what you can't see on camera right now is you can't see my physical size yeah <laughs> like i'm a big i'm a big guy I'm yeah you're six two right i mean you got two, a good I'm, stature I'm, about you yeah. i'm 230 pounds you know i'm still you know i'm 65 but i'm fit you know so that i i, br I bring something into a room that this doesn't show exactly and so uh it's our new world until you get cast and of course you go to the set but we're all you know we're kind of coming through this you know i'm fully vaccinated now so we're others um and so we'll we're going to get through this but uh i will say this to to any of the fans that might be listening is is you know a lot of people are saying well i can't wait to get back to i don't think we're going to get back to anything i think we, we need to move forward yeah you know we need we you know we have sort of a new a new way of looking at things a new way of probably even doing business in in many ways and and that includes my my business i think the going into the casting offices is going to be you know kind of a thing of the past uh from here forward because you can get a lot accomplished on tape and then they can make a decision and then bring you in to a smaller room where there's only maybe four or five actors competing for one role yeah yeah you have to do the, the big casting so. Yeah, I think that would probably be the, the way it'll go. You know, it does make a lot of sense, especially given the scenario that we face. And, uh, you know, hopefully things do get better and we can, there is some sort of n normalcy, right, mm -hmm. that we're kind of used to because that human connection is, right. is an amazing thing. Like, you know, I, I'm excited that I'm actually hopefully be able to meet you there at, in San Antonio, you know, mm -hmm. and maybe even shake your hand if possible. And because, 
you know, that human connection is. is yeah, well, is get ready. Because you're, you're going to be going to Texas and it's going to be it's going to be a completely different environment. But because <laughs> because I'm fully like when we were going after the meet and greet speak originally when, you know, in the middle of the pandemic, um, uh, you know, the I would have my mask off so people could talk to me and see me. They had to wear their mask. Yes. You know, when they were facing me. And then if we got up for a picture, but, but I would say that they're probably going to have whatever rules they might have within the Comic-Con. But I, I would, you know, I would say for pictures and things like that, um, you know, I'm certainly, because I'm vaccinated, I'm, I'm not going to be wearing a mask while I'm sitting behind my table or wherever I'm, you know, talking with the fans. And it'll be their choice to, to you know, or follow whatever the rules are. But it's going to be a little bit more liberal because it is, uh, as far as uh, the mask thing, because yeah. it's Texas. It's so, Texas, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, uh, but, uh, but, but again, we are moving forward in that. We've got about 40% of the population that has had at least the first vaccination. And so we're moving in that direction. So, you know, hopefully uh, uh, by the end of the year, we can be, uh, um, you know, even within our own families, you know, it's like, you know, my, I have a big family in Florida and we're, we're gonna have a big Memorial Day celebration because we haven't had one in, you know, 18 months or yeah. long. It's, you know, it's been going on, so. It's tough. Well, I, I, I want to respect your time, Victor. I know you got a lot of stuff to do. You got a lot of projects you're working on and plus you got to get ready for the convention. So I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and let you go, but I, I want to just want to say, I do appreciate you, uh, you know, coming on zoom here with me and talking with us at geek impulse. And I definitely look forward to seeing you. Hopefully I can get a signed book. That would be awesome and meet you in person, of course. And I just really do appreciate you uh, coming here and I hope that you continue to be fruitful and successful in everything you do. So um, with that being said, I'll definitely uh, leave it to you. Any last words that maybe you might want to say to the fans watching this? I think, you know, basically is um, if, if anything we've, if we've learned, uh, you know, and certainly in this last year uh, through this pandemic is uh, we need to take care of each other. And uh, and um, regardless of where you come from, your color of your skin, your religion, your, you know, your uh, sexual orientation. Um, and uh, and I, I know I'm speaking to a lot of people that are going to be watching this and, and they, you know, they can relate to this and this. Let's just you know, let's just take care of each other. So, you know, peace out. Awesome. Thank you so much, Victor. Talk All right. soon. Okay. Bye.